our next session, Ishwar Allah Tero Naam on Gandhi's secularism from 1.20, which is about 20 minutes from now. Uh, I see that people have already proceeded to the signing zone for the book signing session, which is great. We hope you come back for the next session with us. That will be followed by the announcement of the winner of the Prabha Khetan Women's Voice Awards, which will start from 2.40. I would just like to take this moment to thank some of our sponsors and partners for AKLF 2019, our supporting partner, Future Publishers and Distributors, our knowledge partner, NSHM Knowledge Campus, our institutional partners, British Council, Prabha Khetan Foundation, APJ School, Max Mueller Bhavan, Development Consultants, Halion Fra, Tolly Club, and Kolkata Center for Creativity, our photography partner, Studio 15, our decor and event partner, Navkrit Brand Solutions, our food partners, Food For You, Gupta Brothers and Wow Momo, our food and beverage partner, Cha Bar, as well as Subway, and our tea partner, Thai Food Tea. Queue. We hope to see you in about 20 minutes. The session will be moderated by Kavita Punjabi, who is a professor at the Department of Comparative Literature, where she has been since 1989. She is also the founder coordinator, Center for Studies in Latin American Literatures and Cultures at Jadapur University. For further details about our panelists, please do visit our website, www.aklf.in. I shall now hand over proceedings for the session to our moderator. Hi. I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this session, Ishwar Allah Tere Naam, Gandhi's Secularism. And uh, it's a lovely, nice, colorful place to start this discussion. There's some people out there, I think, they may be interested too in this. Um, I'll, uh, I mean, you've just been introduced to this uh, amazing panel, and I have to confess that I was uh, more than a trifle intimidated in the beginning having these three stalwarts around me, but uh, when I sat down to reflect upon it, I think they're not the jargon-obsessed kind, and uh, it's difficult to write simply, it, you need the wisdom to write simply, and these are people who have that wisdom, so they're accessible, and I think part of this uh, they're also terrific communicators, and this, I think, comes from their professions, because uh, Shugata, Professor Shugata Bose has been a teacher, long-time teacher, and in his recent uh, role as uh, a parliamentarian, he's also delivered one of the most wonderful lectures of the last few years, and if you haven't heard it, you have to go and hear it on YouTube. Uh, on my left is uh, Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi, who needs no introduction, of course, He's a long-time scholar, and it's his past as a journalist, I think, that also makes him such a wonderful communicator. I'm saying this to put all of you at ease in the way I had to put myself at ease, right? And uh, you've got Professor Tridip Surud here, who, of course, I'm very proud to claim as my own teacher, because uh, I did his Gandhi course in Shimla for two weeks. And uh, it's, I think, the simplicity of his communication that really won us over, won many of us seniors over, oldies into coming and sitting in his course and taking that for two weeks. So uh, I think it's also a very, very rare opportunity to have such wonderful and thoughtful scholars with us. So we'll make the most of this uh, morning today. Uh, this whole question of uh, secularism that's been bandied around a lot, uh, let's just think about this in terms of uh, non-sectarian relations between the peoples of this incredibly varied country. And uh, what I'd just like to highlight before we go on is that it's not just the Western definition of secularism in terms of uh, uh, governance irrespective of religion or the Indian nation's definition of uh, Sarva Dharma Sambhava. It's not only Dharma Nirapekshita and Sarva Dharma Sambhava. These are technical terms. But I think what does this mean to us in our lives, in our politics? And uh, we've also had very, very strong spiritual traditions in which the notions of non-sectarianism and uh, cooperation across all peoples has been embedded in our Sufism, in our Bhakti, in the Sant traditions, and uh, of course in our own Baul and Fakir traditions here. So I think we'll be drawing upon a lot of those as we go on. So let's, uh, I'm gonna request each of the speakers to speak for a few minutes and then we'll start up the conversation again. And of course, we cannot talk about Gandhi in isolation because it's the times that made him and he responded to the times. So should we just have Professor Tudip Surud, who's our uh, focused Gandhi scholar here, to talk a little bit about what 
was interesting about Gandhi's secularism. And then I'll request Professor Rajmohan Gandhi and Professor Shugata Bose to talk about a little bit about their own work. I'll come to the specific questions within which we could actually understand Gandhi and his secularism and the secularism of the times because there were several leaders who were actually talking about this, which was the and it was an inevitable question in the context of the formation of the nation of such diverse peoples. So, thank Professor. you, Kavita. Um, you know, um, this word, Ishwar Allah Theronam, is actually Bengal's gift. I hope uh, people in Calcutta remember that. It was this incredibly young Manu Gandhi in Noakhali who, um, through this Perhaps the, uh, the saddest um, walk of Gandhi's life is his companion. And they go from village to village, um, hoping to touch hearts, hoping to be recognized, hoping to be uh, joined in people's prayers. And during this um, walk of Noakhali, that the word, words Ishwar Allah Teronam were added to, to that beautiful Raghupati Raghav Raja Ram, uh, right? and 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 so um, um, it's 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 something which which speaks. Uh, what does it say? Um, it's not denial of God. It's an act of faith. Uh, it's an act of deep faith, deep religiosity, attraction to to God, however conceived, either as truth, either as nature, either as personification, uh, as a text, as a song. Uh, that drew Gandhi. To, to think of Gandhi minus his quest for religion would be to forget the most vital part of him. He constantly tells us that what he really wants to do is not attain free Swaraj. Swaraj will come. It would have come probably even without him. His lifelong quest is to see God face to face. And it is this desire to see God face to face, to have sakshatkar is really what moved Gandhi. To, so the idea of what we call the secular um, is very differently constituted. Uh, and it is constituted by this idea called samabhava. It's a very interesting word. It's a notion of equality, equability, something that's available to all of us. But a samabhav, as we know, is possible only when we do not have its opposite, which is called mamabhava, the notion of mindness, or that this is mine, that this religion is mine, this God is mine, this truth is mine, this identity is solely mine. It's only when we have the capacity to go from a mamabhava to samabhav that any notion of cohabitation po it becomes possible. Right? And I think uh, what Ishwar Allah Teronam really meant for me and continues to mean is this possibility that even I can transcend from my mama bhava to sama bhava in some instances. Not in all, not every time, but that possibility is available even to me. And that, I think, is the beautiful thing about not just that phrase, but that life that makes it possible for us. May I, can you hear me now? Yeah. May I request you to pick up on that and talk a little bit about the unique quality of the times in which such notions Hello. could be mobilized in the political context. And you've also written about the founding fathers of our nation, about the quality of nationalism at that time. So what is it? I mean, this is a very, very personal yet political con uh, statement we are talking about, uh, notion of secularism we are talking about. Could you just fill us in more on this context? I will try. Uh, so as uh, Tridip pointed out, uh, this line, Ishwar Allah Tere Naam, did start off in the village of Paniala in Noakhali in November or December of 1946. So uh, yes, uh, Bengal, the Bengali-speaking world, is very much uh, involved in this amazing thought. But I also wanted to add, uh, in following your steer, uh, 
Kavita, that as important as Ishwara Latere Nam is Gandhi's role in the last two years of his life to make sure that the Indian political leadership was committed to secularism. This is something that is generally not realized, uh, and if known, not remembered, and not understood in its full significance. So I would only say this on the basis of my study of the years 46, 47, 48, before Gandhi was killed January 30, that had Gandhi not insisted in October and November and December of 1947 that the Congress Working Committee and the All India Congress Committee should absolutely reiterate in clear and unambiguous terms commitment to secularism, secularism would not have been part of the Indian Constitution. Uh, of course, uh, Nehru and Patel and Ambedkar, who around this time uh, joined the government and started drafting, uh, was chairing the Constitution Drafting Committee, uh, and Netaji Bose's amazing role for Hindu-Muslim partnership. All that was a very powerful element. But if you look at the political realities and the emotional realities of India in October, November 47, when so many lakhs of refugees had come from West Pakistan to Delhi and from East Pakistan to Kolkata, and some of them also went to Delhi, at that time, it was actually perfectly possible that India might have opted for a Hindu state because even at that time, people in Pakistan were demanding that Pakistan should become an Islamic state. But those who read their history carefully uh, of September, October, November 47, December, would know that Gandhi played a very active role in getting a pure political written commitment. And he, in fact, had a large role in drafting the resolutions of the Working Committee and the Congress Committee to ensure that. So I just wanted to make that also. So, so we understand Gandhi's secularism is not just a religious, semi-religious, uh, sentimental thought. So he, he says, Ishwar Allah Tere Naam, so uh, Hindus and Muslims have the same accessibility to the Almighty, they have the same right to God, but they also have the same and equal right to India. I think this too is something to be understood. Jinnah too insisted on secularism, right? Pakistan started up as a secular nation. So what, what would you see as the difference between Gandhi's secularism and Jinnah's secularism, or the motivations for both? Uh, well, uh, let me uh, begin by uh, you know, picking up on uh, a couple of comments that have been made by uh, Tridip Surhud uh, and Raj, Raj Mohanji. First of all, I think we need to acknowledge that the word secular or secularism uh, tended to be used very rarely in political discourse in pre-1947 India. But that does not mean uh, that um, there wasn't a commitment to equal respect for all religions. And I think we probably should avoid uh, any good intentioned attempt to foist uh, secularism uh, on M Mahatma Gandhi. If we look at uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, uh, life and career over the long term, he displayed equal respect for all religions during his two decades in South Africa. And what I find the most fascinating period uh, in his uh, political life is the period between 1919 to 1922, uh, the classic moment of maneuver, to use Partha Chatterjee's phrase, even though Partha Chatterjee simply looked at an earlier text, Hind Swaraj, while I have been much more interested in reading Gandhiji's writings in Young India. And he was very successful in those years in forging Hindu-Muslim unity. His closest political compatriots were the Ali brothers, Shaukat Ali and Muhammad Ali. But we have to understand that he was describing 
non-violent, non-cooperation as a struggle of religion against irreligion. He was not in favor of separating the domains of religion and politics. And that is because he believed, along with many of his contemporaries in the early 20th century, that if you took religion completely out of politics, you might be evacuating it of any sense of ethics. And that is why um, he was not even saying that we can resort to religion for purposes of political mobilization. He actually said that for both Muhammad Ali and for him, Swaraj was important, self-rule was important, because it is only through Swaraj that the safety of our respective faiths is possible. Now, in this respect, Jinnah at that time differed. Jinnah did not like the fact that Gandhi had struck up an alliance with the pro-Khilafat Muslims. But I think that th that period was fascinating. You even have a Swami Shraddhanand speaking from the pulpit of the Jama Masjid in Delhi. Gandhiji was successful as never before since 1857 in crafting Hindu-Muslim unity. But then there were certain problems. Um, and this is where he differed from his great contemporaries, Jawaharlal Nehru and Shubhash Chandra Bose. Jawaharlal Nehru was sometimes impatient of difference, impatient about expressions of religious difference or linguistic difference. Mahatma Gandhi was not. He respected difference, and on the basis of that respect, he was able to transcend these differences and forge unity. In that respect, he was somewhat closer to Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, but we also must understand that Gandhiji evolved over time. In the early 1920s, he would not even dine together with the Ali brothers. He was quite witty about it. He would say uh, that, uh, you know, uh, this is my bigotry if my self-denial may be so named. He th wrote about eating as one of the privately performed sanitary practices of life. Uh, he also was not at that stage in favor of intermarriage. But what do we find? By the time we reach the 1940s, he, he, in Noakhali, he is asked a pointed question. Do you support interreligious marriages? He honestly answers that at one point I did not, but now I do. He was also in favor of interdining because he met the soldiers of the Indian National Army who were in prison. Uh, in the Red Fort and the Kabul lines, and they complained to him that, you know, we had risen above religious differences in the Azad Hind movement, but now the British are offering us Hindu tea and Muslim tea separately. Why do you suffer it, Gandhiji asked. They said, we don't. We mix Hindu tea and Muslim tea equally and then serve, and the same with food. And Mahatma Gandhi genuinely, you know, approved of it. So we also need to understand that this was a man who was prepared to change with the times. And finally, I entirely agree with Raj Mohanji that Mahatma Gandhi played a glorious role in the period from the end of the Second World War up to his tragic assassination on the 30th of January, 1948. You've already heard about Noakhali. In addition to Ishwara Allah Tero Nam, even when Vaishnava Janato was being sung, in the chorus land, lines, Gandhiji encouraged Manu Gandhi and others to uh, replace the word Vaishnava with uh, Muslim and Isahi and so forth. And um, he tried his best. He failed, as I showed, to prevent the tragic partition. I have an essay on Gandhi from the 45 to 48 period. But then in the few months that he survived independence and partition, he was in Delhi. And at the AICC meeting in mid-November 1947, he chided the Congress leaders. He compelled them to understand that our India does not belong to the majority community alone. The minority communities have an equal right to this free country. And then, of course, came his most glorious and his most poignant fast of January 1948, you know, which uh, was designed to protect the minorities in India and Pakistan and also to try and inject an element of good feeling 
between these two countries uh, that had uh, come into existence in August 1947 as free nation states. Uh, Professor Surud, you've done a lot of work on the relationship between Gandhi's conscience and his politics. And I'd like to bring this back a little bit to that because we are talking about Gandhi and his secularism in the political sphere. But I think it's also important to, for us as citizens today to understand what this meant for Gandhi in personal terms too. So how would you link up his explorations of his own conscience, of his own uh, beliefs, with this, with the political insistence on secularism for the nation. Secularism and non-violence. I mean, I think, uh, uh, um, 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 you know, um, because they, they have to, uh, in some fundamental ways, uh, go together. Yeah. Uh, uh, probably one is not possible without the other um, in, in the real uh, sense. You know, um, from the prison, he wrote these letters, um, which were to explain, because that was the only thing that was what he could do as, uh, as a prisoner, you don't write some things. Uh, so he wrote these letters, which were to, to be read out every Tuesday morning at the ashram community, and, and, and very beautifully called uh, Mangal Prabhat. They were read on Tuesday, but it's also the, uh, uh, the sublime um, auspicious morning. Um, in which he spoke of each of these terms as what they meant to him. And, and there he uh, very simply, but very profoundly speaks of nonviolence. And says, and the, the, the question that he's trying to answer, which is the question that the Ashramites had, but everybody else has, why is nonviolence so fundamental to human life? And he says, the more he took to violence, the more he receded from self. The relationship between uh, the relationship between self, possibility of recognizing yourself, from which the possibility of Swaraj emerges, of Samabhav emerges, it's fundamental for Gandhi to know the working of the conscience. That's one. Two, it's also when is it that you know that your conscience speaks to you? What allows you the capacity to hear that voice? And as Gandhi constantly reminds us, how do you, when you hear a voice, how do you make sure that it is the Rama and not a Ravana speaking from within? Because that voice can be the voice of falsehood. That voice could be the voice of ego. That voice could be the voice of, as he says, Mama Bhava. If, if that's the voice that you hear, then it will take you in one direction. Mm. If it's the other voice, and if you are able to, to, to discern between the voice of truth and the voice of untruth, it's only then that you can act on basis of that. Okay? So this idea of being in touch with oneself is fundamental. Uh, fundamental not only to him in terms of his spiritual practices, but in terms of his conduct as an ashramite, his conduct as uh, a leader of a political movement, uh, or even as a member of a community that was seeking to, as he said, be awake when it was the night of all others. Mm. Mm? Uh, how do you do, when, when, you, when you take on these roles, responsibilities, uh, or if that is your aspiration, how do you do that without certain excess to yourself? And that's, mm. so there's constant um, both need and ability that he acquires mm. to, to know the workings of his conscience. Um, there are times when that eludes him and which he speaks of as moments of great darkness and despair. Mm. Uh, it's not what is external to him. It is that darkness is the inability to find that voice or even um, ha acquire those ears uh, to, to listen to that. So it's very, very crucial. Um, and 
he seems to suggest, and this is the only time that he seems to suggest, that it's not available to everyone equally. Hmm. Right? It's not, conscience is available to everybody. But the ability to hear that voice, make that judgment, comes from years of self-practices. So it's hmm. not something, it's not instinct. It is cultivated, it's practiced, um, it's learned. And, and you constantly, therefore, need to, to do that. Um. Uh, Professor Gandhi, would you like to respond to that? And uh, especially in the context of, you know, what both Professor Bose was saying about Gandhi's insistence on secularism and what Professor Surud was saying about the relationship between Gandhi's conscience and Gandhi's politics. What this reminds us of very strongly is a very unique ethical fiber to Indian nationalism in those days. And that is something that one has not seen as much in most other contexts. So could you situate what, what we're talking about in the context of this ethical fiber of Indian nationalism? What was it about the times, about the people, about the leaders? I'm asking a very open question. You pick up on it wherever you can. Sure. Um, am I being heard? Yes. So. Um, before I answer your very important question, try to answer it, uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Shukatabos for um, his confirmation of this generally forgotten fact of Gandhi's practical role in ensuring that the idea of secularism, if not the word, was enshrined in the Indian constitution. Uh, and there was at least one occasion where Gandhi also said in the 46, 47, that India will be a secular state. He used the, that ex expression also. Um, now, on the ethical dimension of India's nationalist movement, India's freedom movement, uh, there's one story I'd like to relate, uh, which also really connected to Noah. There was an African-American professor called William Stuart Nelson who came to meet Gandhi in Noakhali and Kolkata in 46, 47. Um, he asked, and, and incidentally, on Christmas Day in Noakhali, Gandhi asked William Stuart Nelson to s recite a Christian hymn to a Muslim majority audience, and they were also Hindus. So to me, and, and Gandhi then translates uh, this Christian hymn into Hindi, and um, uh, Nirmal Babu translates it into Bangla. So anyway, that is another picture of Gandhi's secularism. William Stuart Nelson asked Gandhi, you have been preaching nonviolence to India for the last 30 years. Why so much violence today? So let me paraphrase Gandhi's answer. These are not his exact words, but this is what can be paraphrased from what he answered. He said, I've been trying to teach the Indian people two things. Fear not and hate not. He said, fear not became very popular. But hate not was not popular. And he said, we fought the British. And when he says we, he is referring to the Indian people and all those who followed him and who followed the nationalist movement. We said we would not want to hate the British, but in fact, we did. Hate not was not followed. Then Gandhi said, when we agreed that hating the British was fine, then hating the Muslim or hating the Hindu also became fine. So now Gandhi did not always succeed uh, in persuading the Indian people to be absolutely free of fear or absolutely free of hatred, uh, as Tudip suggests, and uh, as Gandhi was a human being, and in his own life he was certainly not a perfect human being. And those who responded to the nationalist call for India's independence uh, were also human beings, and they did not always respond to the no fear, no hate challenge as gallantly as they might have. But I think the important thing to know is that the, at least the idea stayed in the Indian mind and conscience. Even if it was not easy to banish hatred or ill will or malice from our hearts, we knew that it was wrong to nurse those feelings. And to act on those feelings, especially if you were a policeman, if you were a magistrate, if you were a teacher, if you were a father, if you were a prime minister, 
if you were to act on the feeling of ill will or malice, or malice, you would do a very great harm to the Indian society. So that also was a very important dimension to the movement. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gandhi. You know, what you were saying just reminded me of what you were saying about this remaining in people's hearts reminded me of the time when I was teaching Hind Swaraj. And it's a very, very antiquated text for a lot of young people today. And they have to struggle to find meaning in it. But when they do, it's quite amazing. And one of their catchwords became soul force versus brute force. And it was fine. We're going to try this out. And the next week, I kept hearing these amazingly delightful stories of how in their everyday lives, they've decided, OK, here's where I get angry. Here's where I snap. Here's where I get violent. Let me try a completely different tactic. And they came back with these amazing stories about auto drivers who'd been fighting with them about change, people who'd been snapping at them on the road, and how they turned around and been wonderful to them and shocked them out of their wits. And the amazing conversations that came out of it, the kinds of, you know, I'm not saying these are long-lasting bonds, but the kind of little bonds that happened in those moments. So what you're saying is very, very true, because I think they were so receptive to this, partly because it's there somewhere in our historical consciousness. And I think that's it's a wonderful thing to go back to. I'm so glad you highlighted that. Thank you very much. Because there are certain things from our histories that do remain in our historical consciousness. And one just needs to tap them, and they keep coming out. I'm just saying that as little from little experiments with my students. But uh, you know, you're saying this from a much more uh, uh, much deeper understanding of uh, historical processes. But I'm saying it works at both levels, at the level of young people in our classrooms and in their homes, and at this level too. But uh, Professor Bose, I would like you to talk a little bit more about the other people who were also sec uh, uh, major proponents of secularism at this time, in addition to Gandhi. Because I know you've been talking a lot. Uh, as you can see, um, you know, I have been uh, resisting any, you know, easy confirmation uh, of a commitment to secularism. Uh, I think we need to move away from the old secularism, you know, communalism uh, dichotomy. Uh, there, were a, there were a whole range of, uh, you know, political leaders and thinkers who were deeply committed to equal respect for all religions. They were all completely opposed to religious bigotry and religious prejudice, but they themselves often had deep religious faith. Uh, I didn't fully answer your question about Jinnah, but if you look at figures like Nehru and Jinnah, um, they in their personal lives may not have had as deep religious faith as a Mahatma Gandhi, uh, or a Rabindranath Tagore, or a Deshabandhu Chittaranjan Das, uh, or a Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. And yet, you know, when you look back, you find that it is people with deep religious faith who probably contributed more to unity among religious communities, respect for people belonging to different religious faiths. And um, as I mentioned, there is a difference between Nehruvian secularism and what you might call, in retrospect, uh, a Gandhian version of secularism, even though he used that term very sparingly. And it came into common use from 1947 onwards in our political discourse. Shubhash Chandra Bose was an advocate of what he called cultural intimacy among India's different religious communities. He was very concerned that we are too mutually exclusive. We must understand each other. And what I find is that Mahatma Gandhi traveled that distance between 1919 20 and 1946, uh, you know, 47, when he too became an advocate of cultural intimacy. He actually was able to embrace multiple identities in a very difficult, vitiated political atmosphere. When he came to Bengal, and we are all con referring to his time in Bengal in uh, 1946 and 1947, 
he said that he was trying to become a Bengali. And he said, not just, uh, you know, because he wanted to read Rabindranath Tagore's poetry in original, but he cited other reasons. He expressed admiration following his fear not principle for uh, those who took part in the Chittagong Armory Raid. And he said, how could a province which had shown such courage not rise to the occasion now when partition is looming uh, before us? He was able to say that I am a Sanatani Hindu, but uh, you know, just as I am an Indian and a Be Gujarati and a Bengali all at the same time, being a Sanatani Hindu does not prevent me from being a Muslim. I want to recite the Kalma, he's saying, in 1947. And when uh, members of the audience objected to Quranic verses being recited in his prayer meetings in 1947, he said, I will not hold the prayer meeting or not recite sort of any prayers. When he broke his final fast in January 1948, there were recitations from the holy books of practically every major religious faith. Uh, in the world. So that was, you know, uh, you know, Ma Mahatma Gandhi. And we just have to understand that he was doing this in a period when there was conflict, there was violence, and he was showing, you know, genuine courage. And what's more, he was prepared also to sit down with leaders of the Muslim community. People questioned him for uh, being so close to Hussein Shahid Suravardi, because there were many, you know, Hindus in Bengal who were troubled by Suravardi's role at the time of the Great Calcutta killing of 1946. But Mahatma Gandhi said, "Look, Deshobandhu Chitturanjan Das had introduced me to Suravardi at the Faridpur conference during the non-cooperation days. I have known him for a quarter of a century. I can talk to him. I can negotiate with him. I can work with him to restore peace." Uh, in Calcutta and, and Bengal. Also, I have to say that since you asked the Jinnah question, uh, his relations were reasonably cordial with Jinnah. Even in 1946, it is still worth reading the joint statement uh, that they uh, issued uh, in, uh, I think it was April, May, early May 1947, you know, trying to abjure uh, violence. So, you know, these were two people who were prepared to talk to one another. And Jinnah, of course, in his first famous speech, it, that's what I think you were alluding to, to the Pakistan Constituent Assembly, said that uh, you're now free to go to your temples, you're free to go to your mosques, you'll be all equal citizens of the state. That secularism was based on his commitment to equal citizenship. For Mahatma Gandhi, equality was important but it sprang from, from his deep religious faith. Uh, and uh, there was no contradiction between Gandhi's religious faith and Gandhi's commitment to equality, equal citizenship rights, regardless of which religious community uh, you were part of. Thank you. I think that was very beautifully put in terms of the uh, yeah, absolutely. Please. Um, so what you, uh, what uh, Professor Bose said about so many in India, not just Gandhi, Netaji Subhash Bose, and many others, uh, the poet, uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, the great Rabindranath Tagore, uh, who had a very genuine religious faith, and yet they believed in equal rights for all. It's also important to recognize that these personalities had a reasonably comfortable relationship with somebody like Jawaharlal, who did not have a religious faith. So he was an equal partner in all their efforts. Even Vallabhai Patel, you know, people say, oh, he's Gujarati and there's this huge statue for him, so he must be a very deeply religious man. He never went to temples or anything like that. Yes, in his final days when he was dying, he recited some bhajans in his bed some of these bhajans were Muslim bhajans. He, he had a kind of faith in the Almighty, but it was, a, it was not a major part of, of his life. So wh what I think uh, we should recognize if we're going, trying to go back into history, we're talking about you know, 100 years ago, almost 70, 80 years ago, that these amazingly relig religious people who were also willing to be quote-unquote secular 
had a very natural, comfortable relationship with those who were agnostics, who were atheists, who, who did not believe in, in the Almighty, but who also played a great part both in the freedom movement and also in keeping equality uh, in India. Uh, just a little anecdote on, uh, you know, uh, just after non-cooperation had ended, uh, Muhammad Ali became president of the Indian National Congress, and Jawaharlal Nehru was the general secretary of the Congress. And Nehru uh, did not quite like the fact that uh, Muhammad Ali wanted to thank the Almighty in various <laughs> resolutions to be passed by the Congress. Uh, but, you know, the two of them, you know, got along uh, quite well. And uh, Muhammad Ali said that, you know, uh, you can be very superficial about these things, but I think that uh, deep down somewhere, uh, you must have some religious faith. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Nehru has written in his autobiography, I suppose uh, it depends on what you mean by faith. And, and the two of them got along reasonably well, one deeply religious, the other something of an agnostic, at least a skeptic. Um, you know, I, just just to, to build upon what Rajmohanji had said earlier, uh, it's not only, um, I think, under Nehru, Patel, Ambedkar, the commitment of the Indian state, and I'm saying Indian state, no Indian state thereafter has shown such remarkable commitment to confronting violence of every kind. Uh, our lament in our times has been that the state sometimes has been complicit in violence. I think the real difference, uh, and what you said of the ethical nature of the national movement, the expectation Rajmohanji spoke about, that we shall better ourselves uh, even if we fail at, you know, some things, there is always the possibility that we would be reminded of it. That is very important because I think the commitment to protecting equal rights, <clears throat> guaranteeing that you are allowed to practice what you need to, guaranteeing that you will not be excluded or prejudiced because of your belief or lack thereof is very important on part of the state. And I think the contribution of the national movement, and not just Gandhiji, but the national movement, in creating that commitment and expectation from the state is fundamental. If we did not have that expectation of the state, even the possibility of lamenting that the state has failed us or the state continues to fail us would not be there. So I think what, we, what one needs to, I mean, whether, whether the state has the capacity to be Samabhava, it may not. But the state certainly has the capacity not to have mamabhava. And that's important. And that's, that's an expectation of the state that we must hold it accountable to. And that's something which is very valuable. Because without that expectation, no matter how deeply faithful we are in the most eclectic way, the responsibility of the civil society is one, the responsibility of me as an individual is another, but the responsibility of the state is something else. And I think that's something that is a great gift um, that we've had. I'm so glad you brought it to that, Professor Surud, because when we are talking about something like this, when we are talking about something like this, I think uh, I'm reminded of one of the worst crises of this century in India during the quote-unquote riots in Gujarat, which, we, which many of us also call a pogrom, is that uh, when the state let us let people down completely, and when I say us, I mean it let Hindus, Muslims, Christians, everybody down. It was not just the Muslims that let down in Gujarat. And at that time, I know that the only, only singular platform that the people who'd been victimized in Gujarat, that the Muslims had, was the platform of citizenship. And it was the... It was this platform of citizenship that became a national platform for all of us who were clamoring for justice there. We were making precisely these demands of the state. 
that the state is answerable. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about uh, the kinds of expectations that were set up. But uh, I think we also need to uh, look a little bit now at what's happened, why? And how do we confront this as citizens of this country today in terms of a discrediting of these very fine values that went into the making of the Indian nation? And uh, the values that were enshrined in our constitution and were operative in our state also. How do we, uh, I mean, we could talk about what's happened, but I think equally important is how do we confront this decline in values today? I'm phrasing it in the largest of terms possible again to... <laughs> well, not really, <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, well, in, in some ways, uh, there was a great failure of uh, state-sponsored secularism and state-sponsored socialism, uh, particularly in, in the 1980s. Uh, and I think uh, Hindu majoritarian nationalism was able to take advantage of the fact that uh, secularism and socialism had been reduced to rather empty slogans, uh, devoid of, uh, of any, uh, any real substance. And, uh, you know, I have grown up in post-independence India, bred in the Nehruvian secular tradition. But when I saw the initial sort of rise of Hindu majoritarian nationalism, when I uh, heard of the destruction of the Babri Masjid in 1992, you know, I felt that uh, you know, we as scholars and historians also needed to rethink secularism and that we ought not to be abandoning such an important domain of religion entirely to the religious bigots. And it's in that context that in so far as I have uh, uh, tried to contribute to the public debate in the last five years, including in parliament, uh, I have really tried to say that we must really rescue religion in all its amplitude from the religious bigots and also you know, rescue nationalism from the narrow chauvinists. You know, in, at a theoretical level, I can be a critic of nationalism. We all know that there is an oppressive aspect and a liberating aspect of nationalism. But in our country and in so much of the colonized, erstwhile colonized world, you know, nationalism is almost equated with the freedom struggle. And that's why we cannot sort of let you know, the narrowest definition of nationalism to prevail. That, that is precisely why we need to go back to learn from the extraordinary books of life of Mahatma Gandhi and his contemporaries to somehow, you know, re-nourish and re-energize a very broad and general, uh, generous secular ethos in, in our country. You know, that's the only way that we will be able to combat uh, those who are spreading the poison of religious hatred uh, all over our country. Yeah. Uh, we'll open it up, but I just have one little question. Because uh, the times when uh, people from different religious uh, backgrounds have come together, Hindus, Muslims, in the context of nationalism, in the context of uh, wars against economic exploitation, and uh, what I'm really reminded of in the, in the middle of all this is a slogan that mothers used to chant during the Tebhaga movement. I can't remember the whole thing, but it was something to do with Amima Tumima. And it went on and it says, Dari tiki bhai bhai, mathe ne me jat nai. Dari or tiki, dari or tikiya, dono bhai bhai hai, aur medan me utarne se jat nai hai. Now, there's a very simple wisdom enshrined in this, that when together you are fighting a battle, there is no difference between the Hindu and the Muslim. So my question is that, is the bat are the battles that are fired between Hindus and Muslims also diverting from the larger struggles that we have in our context? You know, because it's the communal battles that take away 
from the larger struggles for other kinds of development, for genuine development, genuine moving ahead, which have actually shown themselves in other economic battles earlier, in battles against feudalism, battle against supremacy of, uh, the, of wealth. So uh, if, any, if any of you would like to add something to this, please, before we open up, one last word from each of you, no, 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 before we open up. Um, if now you know Gandhi Nehru died a long time ago, but supposing they had been alive, supposing Netaji had been alive, would they have allowed this malice and ill will lynching to go on without the sternest possible comment? And you know, you ask, why are we here? And of course, all of us and our forebears, this generation, previous generation, earlier generation, all of us are responsible to create the India of today. But if there's one very major reason for the unchecked advance of bigotry today, it is the silence of the most important and influential persons in India. And in the light of that, the ball is really in our court. Every father, every mother, every neighbor, every teacher, every citizen has to assume the mantle of leadership. Thank you so much. We'll open up, the, we'll open up for the questions from the audience. Please identify yourself and make your questions really short. We'll take three questions now. And let's take the questions together and then you answer them. Yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, my name is three Kamal. quick questions. First. My name is Kamal Prakash. Uh, do you think uh, implementation of uniform civil code would address the issue of secularism in the country? Thank you. Next question, please. My name is, uh, is Shoman Sangupta. My question is, in the entire discussion, time and again, Noah Khali came. And I am quite convinced that uh, all three of the speakers, collectively you believe that Ishwar Allah Tero Naam, this iconic line which was born in Noakhali, it was very much apt and Gandhi was very much a champion in Noakhali. My question is, honestly as a historian, do you think Gandhi was indeed, Gandhi was indeed a champion in Noakhali? I am asking this question because from my family, two people stayed two months with Gandhi and the version what I got from them is very pathetic. They said Gandhi is more than 100% more than a failure in Noakhali. Will you please clear my doubt? The two person I mentioned, both of them are no more alive. One is Alorani Rokhit, another is Priti Moy Nundi. They are elderly people of my family. They were volunteers in Gandhi's camp for two months. And they very clearly at the last stage of their life, they, con they uh, confessed to me that Gandhiji was a failure in Noakhali. Will you please clear it on this? Third question, please, and then we'll take this. There is somebody else there? Hi, uh, my name is Raj. Uh, my, my question is to Raj Mohan, sir. Uh, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, Shahid Bhagat Singh, uh, Jallianwala Bagh, these were very, uh, both of these uh, were very big sacrifices. They are icons. In today's age of WhatsApp, Facebook, social media, misinformation, they spread uh, that uh, Mahatma Gandhi's contribution to India's independence struggle was very tokenism. We got freedom because of Shahid Bhagat Singh and Netaji Shobhash Chandra Bose, uh, Indian National Army. How do we communicate otherwise? I mean, I mean, they were very important, not to discredit them. They were very, they are our icons. But uh, our India, our independence struggle revolved around Mahatma Gandhi. So how do we communicate uh, this misinformation? Thank you. How do we correct this mis misinformation? Uh, was Gandhi a failure in, uh, in, in Noakhali? Now, uh, the uh, Noakhali disturbances uh, broke out in October of 1946. Gandhiji was not able to reach East Bengal until November of, uh, of that year. And by the time he reached uh, Noakhali, uh, terrible violence had broken out in neighboring Bihar. Now, if the vulnerable Hindu minority had been 
the victims in Noakhali and Kumilla. Uh, it was the vulnerable Muslim minority that had been attacked in Bihar. And this is what, you know, Gandhiji had to say. Is it nationalism to seek barbarously to crush the 14% of the Muslims in Bihar? But he did not immediately go to Bihar. And the comment that I have made in an essay that I have written about Gandhi in that period is this. The apostle of nonviolence was destined to follow the trail of violence, putting out the embers after the fires had done their destruction, and supplying a healing touch to those who had been singed by its flames. I think that in Noakhali, Gandhiji was able to apply that healing balm. And also, I might add that when Punjab was being convulsed in violence in August 1947, on Independence Day, Kolkata remained peaceful. And that credit belongs entirely to that one-man army called you know, Mahatma Gandhi. And finally, just a question about, you know, you mentioned Shubhash Chandra Bose and the INA. You know, I have read every sentence that Gandhiji had written between 1945 and 1948 and tried to listen to every word that he had spoken as reported by Pierre Elal and Tendulkar and so on. And it's fascinating to find that every reference to Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose between late 45 and January 48 is in the form of a eulogy. And on 23rd January, which is coming up in 1948, one week before his assassination, Gandhiji was very glad to take note of Netaji's birthday, even though he said he generally did not remember such dates. And he added, and, and quote, the deceased patriot believed in violence, unquote, while he was wedded to nonviolence. But then he went on to say that Netaji knew no provincialism nor communal differences and had in his brave army men and women drawn from all over India without distinction and evoked affection and loyalty, which very few have been able to evoke. And that's why he called upon his countrymen to, quote, cleanse their hearts of all communal bitterness in memory of that great patriot. And that's what our task is to today, to try and cleanse Indian hearts of all communal bitterness. Thank you. Uh, if one of you would quickly answer the question about the uniform civil code, we'll have one quick round because there's three more questions there. I think we should just take a few more. In theory, in theory, a uniform civil code would be a wonderful idea. In practice, if now today any government says from today we will enforce uniform civil code, we will remove the Hindu undivided family tax provision, and we will remove other provisions that uh, apply to Islam or to Christians or, or to Sikhs, it will create more problems than we may solve at the moment. Thank you. Let's take three more questions, very quickly, short ones. And if you can say who it's directed to, then that might make it uh, briefer. Yeah. yeah, actually, I'm Salil Tripathi. I have a comment, actually, and very, very brief, I'll make it. And this was about the Noakali question. Since I've been to the ashram and spoken to Jarna Devi Chaudhary and Arup Raha, all I will say is this. I don't want to question anyone's individual memory of what happened. And of course, I wasn't there. But I spoke to the people at the ashram in 2012 as part of my work on my book. They said that after he left, Till then, which was about 2015, when I was 15 is when my book came out, so 2014, there hadn't been a single communal incident in Noakhali. Thank you. There was one more. There was a, there was a woman there who raised her hand. Please, yes, identify yourself and ask. 
Uh, hi, I'm Ritu Bhagat. Uh, honored to be in front of this panel. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, we, you have the Hindutva in India. We have the white evangelical uh, supremacists in the US. Um, we have the Shias in one, one side, the Sunnis in the other. Is this a global trend? Where do you see it going? I mean, this, this thing about I'm exclusive and make everybody the other. Where do you see this going? And you know, I, you're all equipped to answer this. I, one more question, one last question. Okay, fine. Yeah. Let's uh, oh. start. I, I'll try to answer the last one. Um, I have a feeling that there is a beginning in India towards reversing the tide. So there is definitely a global trend, absolutely a powerful global trend. Ten years ago, it was, we'll globalize. Then the slogan has become, we will tribalize. But now, in the last few months, India is beginning to see the distinct possibility of a change. And may India lead the way in a return to those better ideals. We have five more minutes. Oh, wonderful. OK, apparently we have five more minutes. There's one question here. Yes. And I'm, there's, yes, after that, you. I'm Kunur Kripalani, and just to address this religious question, we have, um, a, in history, you know, what we consider the great leaders, and I'm sure that's open to interpretation, but Akbar held these interfaith kinds of uh, darbars, Gandhiji did, and around the world now and again, you hear of these interfaith gatherings do you think that this may be a, a way forward, away from these religious battles that we are facing right now? Thank you. Yes, please. I, I'm Oitijo. I just want to ask. Sorry. I'm Oitijo. I just want to ask if we as a nation have forgotten the scars of partition. Like if we go to Berlin, it's in, impossible to evade World War II and what happened to the Jews. Do you think one of the reasons why riots and communal disharmony is keeping on happening is because we have somehow forgotten what it means when two of the larger communities fight? And if so, what can be done to refresh our memory to that? One last question, please. If anybody has one. Yes. Um, hello, I'm Adarsh. And uh, so in light of the Stabrimala judgment, uh, this is directed to the entire panel. How much do you think the government should have a say in a person's religion? As in what religion should mean to an individual? How far the, can the government or the court intrude upon that? Thank you. Now, um, let me take the last question. I have increasingly come to believe, to my great peril personally also now, that the domain of the judiciary should be restricted. I think it's wrong for us as people to think that the judiciary is capable of a moral judgment. It is capable of a technically legal judgment. That's all that it's expected to do. It's not expected to be ethical. It's certainly not an arbitrator of morality. If we secede our rights to the courts of what is moral, I think we as a society will be under the tyranny of the courts. I'm sorry. I am actually of the opinion that certain aspects of our conflict need not and ought not be arbitrated upon by a system called judiciary. That's my, right? it's not a question of faith. I think law as a category, law as a discipline is incapable of foregrounding morality. It can foreground something else equally valuable, which is justice. But that is not necessarily morality. So I, I am on that very different belief from the idea that the courts are the savior of sanity. I think we need to refigure our relationship to judiciary. I think very seriously that. Um, 
Yeah. Have we um, become uh, forgetful of the human tragedy of, uh, of partition? Well, to some extent, yes. But my view is that the real difficulty arises, even today, because we entrenched and institutionalized the hatreds of uh, 1947 in the two beleaguered states, uh, which have been in conflict with one another. And therefore, it will require real statesmanship and a real subcontinental vision to somehow leave those hatreds behind and emphasize the commonalities and what we share and how much of a better future we will have if we can cooperate and if we are not constantly in conflict uh, with, uh, with each other. And yet another point, in remembering partition and learning lessons uh, from it, uh, we should understand that the violence that occurred was not in any simple way triggered by religious fanaticism. What happened, for example, in rural Punjab, which was engulfed in violence, was a scramble over Zar, Zameen, and Zan. You know, wealth, land, and women within the patriarchal structures of our agrarian society. So we have to be very clear about the place of religion in our politics, including what we see as you know, political violence today. And finally, you know, in remembering partition, uh, we need not just to face up to and come to terms with the ter terrible tragedy that had transpired, but also learn our lessons from what Mahatma Gandhi tried to do in 1946 and 1947. Uh, we mentioned Noakhali more partly because we, are, we were based in Bengal, but he did go to Bihar with Abdul Ghaffar Khan, the frontier Gandhi, and he visited devastated Muslim homes. He then came to Calcutta during independence, went to Delhi in September, and even in January, days before he passed away, he was uh, visiting the Chishti Shrine in Meharoli, lamenting how the beautiful screens of that shrine had been damaged. And appealing to Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, you know, not to be tempted by Satan, but rather, you know, to follow the path of God. If I may add something here, I think what continues to amaze me is that communities keep talking about how the other community persecuted them during the partition. This was no Holocaust. This was not a powerful group from above decimating a powerless group. It was Hindus and Muslims wrecking havoc on each other. It was reciprocal. And even as we seek reparation, saying they did this to us, we forget that we were violators as much as we were victims. And whom do we seek reparation from? From the very people we violated. That's one angle to this. And the other is that there's many, many people's stories, stories at the level of people's lives and interactions that are now surfacing, that talk about how the people who understand us the deepest and the best are the people who violated us as much as we violated them. Nobody understands displaced Indians as much as displaced Pakistanis do. Nobody understands displaced Pakistanis as much as displaced Indians do. Because we share a mutual guilt. We share a mutual culpability. There's a mutuality of evil that's taking place here that we are reluctant to admit. And I think that nature of radical evil may transcend human abilities, but the ability to accept one's culpability is human. And the ability to transcend that and move beyond that into acceptance, into mutual acceptance, is in our hands. So I think a lot lies in our hands now in terms of the kinds of stories we're going to unearth, in terms of the ways in which we're going to begin understanding each other. 
I just add one line to this very important statement that Kavita has made. Uh, my research of the 47 killings in Punjab, it's part of my history of Punjab, showed that many more Muslims protected Hindus and Sikhs in West Punjab than killed them. Many more Hindus and Sikhs in East Punjab protected Muslims than killed them. So in addition to what you say, there was also amazing bravery, compassion, protection at that time. I think that's the perfect note to end on today. Thank you so much, all of you. It's been really, really a wonderful panel. Thank you very much.